The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. Our next presenter is going to be Chris Baugh. He's with Vector Corrosion, and he's going to talk about uh, wrap number six, vertical and overhead spa repair by hand application. Chris Ball is a vice president of Vector Corrosion Technology, Technologies, a leading provider of solutions to preserve and extend the service life of concrete structures. Chris has over 20 years of construction industry experience with a specialty in concrete rehabilitation and corrosion protection systems. He's a member of NACE, ICRI, and ACI, where he is currently the chairman of ACI E706, Concrete Repair Education. Okay, thank you, George. But great turnout. Really fantastic to see so many people have interest in these, in these documents. And um, the next uh, repair application procedure or wrap document, as we refer to them, is uh, repair application procedure number six vertical and overhead spall repair by hand application. So, you know, very common problem with regard to concrete structures. Uh, in the applications where we see um, vertical and overhead repairs completed and other types of concrete repair as well is due to uh, due to corrosion. Uh, there are other uh, causes as well, but corrosion is really a primary, uh, primary issue. And uh, the corrosion is not so much of the concrete itself, but of the reinforcing steel that's embedded within the structure. So you just see some different examples of, of corrosion, you know, with precast structures, um, as well as cast in place concrete. One thing I just always think it's kind of interesting um, in the upper left photo is a, a structure that was contaminated and uh, painted uh, and maybe they thought that that was solving the, the problem by putting a protective coating on it, but the spalling occurred subsequent to that. So, and that's just something for, in my mind, that we want to think about is that uh, just not think about the application procedure itself, but consider that this is part of a larger process and it really starts with having a fundamental understanding of what the cause of the, of the problem is in an evaluation process. And eventually, through the decision-making process, we are zoning in on this uh, more specific area with regard to repair strategies and concrete re repair uh, materials and, uh, and um, application procedures. So this is one of many options that we can use to, to preserve and extend the life of structures. So what's the purpose of this repair procedure? Um, it's pretty, you know, it's a pretty common procedure. I would say um, compared to maybe just casting normal concrete, uh, vertical and overhead spall repair is probably the most, one of the most common procedures that you'll see. You know, the, the purpose of the repair is to replace spalled or t deteriorated concrete of some sort. And, you know, subsequent to that, you know, we want to improve the appearance of the structure. We want to remove any type of loose concrete that could provide safety issues. And then also we want to provide protection to the reinforcing steel. So if it is, if this is a corrosion related issue, we want to provide a protection to the re reinforcing steel within the repair area. So we're reinstating the structure and providing protection at the same, same time. This method is commonly used for smaller repairs. So what we're talking about is using um, hand application uh, with, with trowels. It's a manual process. The materials are, are, are made specifically for this type of repairs. So this method is usually for smaller, thin, or even like cosmetic repairs. For vertical and overhead surfaces, you know, we're talking about columns, beams, walls, building facades. And um, one thing just always like to talk about is that when you start looking at larger repairs uh, that get more structural in nature, you may want to look at other types of repair application procedures and materials, such as uh, some examples there, form and pump and pour applications, you know, shotcrete type repairs. Uh, or graded pre-placed aggregate. And you'll learn more about these uh, application procedures in some of the other presentations as well. 
So once again, we're looking at smaller, smaller repair cavities that are going to be repaired. There's a good application for an isolated repair that's a hand or a trial applied repair. And this is, a, this is more of a major structural repair of a column, which we would probably look at using a different type of method than just the trialing on some repair mortars here. So the process really starts with, uh, after you're understanding the cause of the problem is bulk concrete removal. And we've seen you know, the, the need to use lighter weight shipping hammers. Heavy hammers are hard to use, first of all, just physically, but also can create a lot of concrete damage. And we're dealing with small repairs here. So you're really kind of being able to use in a, in a more detailed uh, way around the reinforcing steel to create uh, to remove the damaged uh, concrete. Uh, we also want to create a rough surface profile for bonding. You know, we talked about, it depends on the manufacturer, you have to look at their information of the materials themselves, but typically we're looking at something like a quarter inch amplitude roughness of the material. Um, if you go to the ICRI surface um, preparation guidelines, that's going to be something that's in the higher range of the surface preparation guidelines, it's something more like CSP 8 or 9, you may want to look at their manufacturer's data sheets to see what they specifically recommend. The concrete surface profiles with the lower numbers are typically used for sealers and coatings and other types of things like that. So you continue the bulk removal until you get this clean steel. Uh, one thing that's really important is to make sure that you have clearance behind the reinforcing steel. Uh, one of the primary causes of failures or repairs, uh, and we've come a long way now, is just doing surface repairs just to cover the, the outer surface of the steel and repair that cavity. We want to basically be able to chip behind the bar, effectively be able to grab the bar all the way around so that we know that the bar is, is clean all the way around and we create a new nice alkaline environment around the bar and the material is able to fully encapsulate the bar within the repair area. And like I mentioned earlier, please always follow the manufacturer's instructions. These are general, general guidelines. Proper um, concrete repair preparation. It's not only a concrete bulk removal, but we also want to create nice, sound saw cut edges in order for the material to have a good performance. Um, these, basically the patch shapes should be square or rectangular. If you have really crazy shapes of, of repairs and, and you're gonna have lots of bonding areas where you could have, or areas where you could induce stress in the, in the repair material and, and maybe have some isolated cracking. So from a repair uh, durability standpoint, these simple shapes like squares and rectangles are the most uh, effective. And the saw cutting along the edges gives yourself, eliminates the possibility of having feather edges. Feather edges, when you get out to the edge of the repair material where you have a very thin, thin section that can have higher shrinkage and less maybe cause some bonding durability issues. Having a nice sound uh, edge along the patch uh, it significantly improves the durability and longevity of, the re of these repairs. Preparation and cleaning. Uh, once we've gone in and we, we've removed the bulk concrete, that's a kind of a dirty procedure and, and what we need to come back and do is make sure that we do a secondary cleaning of the, of the repaired or the prepared structure uh, concrete area in order to ensure we get proper bonding. Okay, so we want to uh, abrasive blast or water blast the, rep the repair area to remove any contaminants, dust, any types of fractured. If you do have like small fractured areas that are subsurface from the bulk removal, the, the secondary cleaning, we want to remove those to promote good bonding. Um, remove any types of evidence of rust or the cement paste from the reinforcing steel and in order for that to, to um, first of all, remove any contaminants, which may be in the paste. If you're dealing with chloride contaminated concrete, you still may have chlorides in the cement paste uh, that may be bonded to the steel after your bulk removal. You wanna make sure you get all that off the steel so you get a really good alkaline chloride-free repair material bonded in the concrete to the reinforcing steel and, and the surrounding concrete. And once again, you look at the, the repair material manufacturers, for different surface preparation, but general consensus is you want concrete to be, you know, kind of um, uh, saturated, but still somewhat kind of dry on the surface. And one of the best, you know, I think guides for this is, is 
ICRI guideline, which you see referenced at the bottom, very good uh, information, on, and, and that applies to a lot of the different methods that we talk about. So once you have everything clean, you know, what, what do you do to the reinforcing? There's options. You can just use no additional protection, just rely upon the materials themselves, the alkaline material, to provide protection to the steel. Uh, in some cases, um, specifiers will require or request a coatings to the reinforcement. If that's the case, you want to follow the recommendation of the manufacturer and, um, and provide the coating to the reinforcing steel before the repair materials is applied. And then you can also look at galvanic anodes within the repairs or combinations of, and you see at the bottom, a combination of a galvanic anode and a, uh, and a reinforcing coating. So just look at the specifications for the project and see what is what has been called out. Okay, material selection and, and uh, equipment, very similar to what we saw before dealing with uh, your, these materials are non-sag, they're a little more cohesive because you're going in vertical overhead surfaces. Um, the materials properties should be, be, be specified, but these are, once again, generally gonna be proprietary materials with a certain rheology. Many of them are lightweight in nature. Uh, they allow to get additional build and thicknesses. Um, look at the, you need some equipment to measure the, the water volume. Also look at the bag weights and make sure you're getting at the right um, mix ratio. And obviously some other uh, equipment, air compressors, saw cutting, uh, things that we talked about earlier, trowels and other fin finishing equipment to get the surface appearance that you like. Safety considerations, you know, with uh, the current movement toward um, airborne silica regulations, you know, anytime we're drilling, chipping into concrete, we want to make sure that you know good PPE is is followed. So follow the OSHA standards. Be aware of them. Review the SDS, the safety data sheets, to see what are the components within the material that you're using that are uh, that you need to be aware of from a protection standpoint. You know these materials are typically Portland cement based. Portland cement is an alkaline material. Appropriate PPE. You see in this photograph here. Um, you know respirators as well as um, eye protection and, uh, and skin protection on this, on this worker. Procedures, which, after you prepare the surface, it's saturated surface dry. Typically, you're, you do your, your reinforcing treatment if required. Uh, you're gonna come in and um, apply the material at a thin layer to begin with uh, to make sure you get intimate contact between the repair material and the substrate. Um, many people in the past have called this a slurry coat. We don't like to use that term because we, want, we don't want to overwater the first coat which could uh, affect the bond. So just a thin layer of the, of the material that you have pushed into the surface to create the intimate contact in, into the roughness of the, of the parent concrete and make sure that you're pushing it into around the reinforcing steel and, and around uh, into the corners of the, of the repairs. You know, you basically are gonna build it out. If you need to put in additional lifts, then you need to be aware that you know, you're gonna have an interbond between one layer to the next. It's a good idea to roughen that up uh, to create some mechanical adhesion uh, between the materials. And then obviously you're gonna strike it off, level it, uh, finish it however is specified or needed, and then follow the manufacturer recommendations for, for curing. Most commonly, you're gonna have some type of moist cure period or um, in vertical and overhead applications, curing compounds, or it's easy to uh, use and apply. And then, um, uh, but making sure that you get the maximum performance out of the material and the application is you need to make sure that they're, they're cured properly. Check and repair. Uh, once the repair is completed, this is a before and after. Uh, you see the, the initial kind of spall by the time you follow the procedures and you chip out the delaminated concrete, the repair gets a little larger. We heard before mentioned before and after pictures. You can't ever have enough pictures. The marketing department likes pictures too, uh, but you also from a from job site documentation is very very good. Uh, you, sometimes you will do, have a, a qualified independent laboratory do testing on the on the materials themselves. Another uh, way that you can do quality control is look at bond testing. There's an ICRI and an ASTM guideline for direct tensile pull-off testing of the repair material. And this, some of the simple things is just maybe going back and doing another sounding of your patch to see if there's any types of, of you know, delaminations or, or hollow spots that need to, be, need to be repaired. And with that, that gives you a, a quick overview of repair application procedure number six. Thank you.
You had talked about exposing the reinforcing steel. Are there any provisions in the document about how far back to go to get to reinforcing steel that isn't seeing any kind of corrosion? And then second to that and related, at what point do you actually need to cut rebar out and replace it? Okay, so this document doesn't get into that level of detail from my recollection, but it has references to other guidelines. And we mentioned the ICRI guidelines. You know, the ICRI guideline, you know, there's a first level is to get back to sound to sound concrete area. But if you are starting to, if you still see in the reinforcing steel significant areas of corrosion, that that guideline recommends that you maybe make the, even if you're chipping into sound concrete, to make the repair area larger to get outside of the real corrosive areas of the, of, of, of the repair area. And that would be a way to really maximize the, the durability of that repair so that you don't have additional corrosion. Um, sorry, what was the second part? What point do you actually cut the reinforcing steel out? Okay, that's an engineering decision, um, less than an application decision. Um, but there are some guidelines with regard to cross-sectional loss that are other, in other documents. Um, at what point do you cut, maybe you may, you may not cut the steel out, you may do lap splices within the, within the, um, within the repairs themselves to re rebuild the, the strength before you come back with an additional repair. And I think when you're dealing with just one spot, and maybe some of you also have experience with that, but that's a great question. Great question. Anybody else have experience with that? Okay. Another question? Please go to the mic because we're, we're taping these, these sessions. Uh, just to confirm that, yeah, I had experience with that. One and a half times was fine. We didn't go the same size, but one and a half. So one and a half, not three. Yeah. Right. So you, you cut it down to uh, yeah, three eighths would be okay. Yeah. Yeah. But you can experiment. I, I've learned so much by not assuming anything. Just do something that makes sense that you want to do and then test it. Pull test, take it apart, chip at it, and uh, build confidence in your procedures. Anything else? Awesome. We got, oh, you got one more. Okay. Tough question. Hi. I can tell. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to know, do you suggest using bonding agents for repair, uh, repair material? Because I saw in the slides you didn't use any. Yeah, so bonding repairs. agents, uh, I started my business 45 years ago, and I was told you need bonding agents. And uh, so I used bonding agents, and I... I used epoxy at the time, that's all they had, and, and I had failures because the epoxy would set up, so I was bonding against a polyethylene bucket, essentially. So then I, I, we started experimenting and realizing that in a lot of applications, depending on the mix, especially with the SEC and these, these mixes that are actually designed to be self-priming, you don't need it. If you can eliminate a step, Murphy's Law, uh, you don't have to worry about Murphy's Law. You know? so, so keep it simple. And you can test it. That's why you do the bond test. You can do a mock-up. Uh, there may be applications. I try to avoid them because it, if, it, if it's not done right, it sets up or creates another problem. It creates a bond breaker. I've seen a lot of bond breakers. I've seen other contracts. I've seen massive failures. On the Bay Bridge in, in, in Maryland, they used two kinds of bonding agents on uh, six miles, three lanes wide, 18 lane miles, all delaminated because of a bonding agent. Nobody tested it. Not one test on 18 lane miles, causing uh, a lot of people to get fired, a lot of people to get sued, and it's all in, it, it was all unnecessary. So bonding agents are very risky. If you treat them that way, you can use them, but you gotta manage it, and you gotta test it. Great question. Thank you. Well, this concludes session one, uh, part one of two. Thank you very much.